Do it. Scratch that midlife crisis ego itch best we can in five, four, three. Welcome to Through the Glass. I'm, I'm really pleased to have um, Richie Birkenhead, a songwriter, somewhat producer, as he says, a lyricist, a singer, and a creative director as well. You may know him from bands such as Youth of Today, Underdog, and The Mighty Into Another. Richie, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. I will, uh, as this is not your first one, I'll resist the uh, the through the glass joke that I'm sure someone else has made prior to my visit. So I'll, I'll leave that alone. I won't touch it. Thank you. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I am I, I am looking at Michael through glass, just you know, for the benefit of uh, the audience that doesn't have the camera swivel around, and uh, yeah, so I can see all his facial tattoos um, <laughs> through the glass. Dude, I did I did some nasty crimes for those tattoos. <laughs> nasty, nasty. Um, I hit you up randomly. I was watching a documentary and I'm sorry, I don't remember the title of the documentary, but it was, it, it was centered around interviewing various um, people from what is then called and still is known as the hardcore scene of a certain era, maybe like in the 90s era is what they were focusing on. And they interviewed okay. you and they interviewed all sorts of other cool people. And you, your spot, you were talking about this early influence in your life, um, having a record in your home, a Mozart album called Ein Klein Nacht Music, uh, which I just always assumed was a little night music, but apparently the proper is a little serenade. And how this record sort of, I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to use your words, but really you you had a serious experience with this record and it really influenced you and it became a pretty major touchstone in your creative life. And I'm watching this documentary and I had the same exact experience as a kid with the same exact record, the same context, and it has stuck with me my entire life, this music. Uh, so I just like hit you up <laughs> on, on social media. Thank you. Know, social media is pretty fucked up a lot of it but there's so many the, good uh, things i believe the young people use the term you you slid into my dms i think is what uh it's what <laughs> Sounds, i don't like what that the, at all I, uh, <laughs> yeah i'm i'm always i'm always being facetious um yeah well what what really um what happened was the the first records i own meaning you know aside from the records i stole from my older brothers which were you know, Beatles and Dylan and Stones and Pink Floyd records. Um, my grandparents bought me my first two LPs, and one of them was a Chuck Berry compilation, basically. I think it was called Chuck Berry's Golden Hits, and and the other was the aforementioned uh, Mozart. Um, and, and both of them, I mean, you know, really touched me deeply, you know, partly because they were mine. They were my records, so I just played them, uh, you know, back to front over and over and over again. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, for me, like it really, um, it, it really wowed me that there was such a broad kind of infinite spectrum of emotions you could evoke with music and places you could go in your head and textures and sounds and aesthetics and, and, uh, and dynamics and stuff. So yeah, it was those two albums that sort of started me on my journey it's endless the things that can give input and that input i had to jot it down because i don't know my history too too well but you know he he died i think in 1787 or or, or was i'm sorry maybe he was born in 1787 yeah, but he was dead by the time he was 35 yeah he he died very young. a lot of great composers did i mean my favorite composer maybe of all time chopin died when he was 39 frederick chopin so you know, you look at the body of work these people put out, you know, before they were 40. and It's nuts. Um, yeah. He had written that, the the, li the Little Serenade, the Ein Klein Nacht music. He had written that, I guess, one, it was one of the last pieces he had written, the last serenades. It was maybe four years before he passed. And it wasn't, it's so funny, I want to say like released. <laughs> like there was a release date. And a fucking yeah, so what composers <laughs> would do then is they would they would publish pieces of music and... And so a lot of their greatest pieces were published posthumously, you know, like one of Chopin's greatest nocturnes, number 20. His last one was published after his death. 
And also what's common with a lot of the great composers is they're, they're not as fond of their most loved pieces or weren't in their lifetime, uh, you know, as what happened subsequently in subsequent decades and centuries, you know, people grew to love certain pieces of music and identify composers with those pieces of music. And, uh, and often you'll, you'll find out that they were among the least favorite pieces of music uh, in, in the minds of those composers, which is just kind of a funny thing. Sometimes I think a lot of artists struggle with sometimes the, the hippest and the catchiest thing that you write, so to speak, mm -hmm. in a modern parlance. Sometimes you just, I think by nature, being an artist, uh, you're least proud of those things because you're like, oh, yeah, or, anybody could write that. Like, or being an artist, you're you're fucked up and you're prone to self-sabotage and feelings of self-loathing and self-doubt. And, you know, so yeah, like, that factors in too. Yeah, and your friend's like, that's an amazing riff. You're like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How exactly. did you get um? How did you get going um, with art and music? What were what were are some of the the earlier catalysts in your life? Uh, well, I, I grew up in a in a pretty creative family. My mother is a composer and lyricist, primarily a lyricist, but you know, grew up with a piano in the house and multiple stringed instruments and percussion instruments and other things. And you know, from the time I was you know, before I was walking, I was sit, I was you know propped up underneath my mom's baby grand piano while she was playing. So there was always music in my life, and and her brother was actually um, a, a really accomplished banjo player of all things. So the first instrument I wanted was what my uncle Steve played, which was the banjo, and uh, and that started me playing. Um, you know, when I was I don't know five or six years old, and uh, shortly thereafter I got a guitar because I loved. I loved rock music, you know, I was, as a kid, my my first favorite artists were uh, were the Beatles and Bowie and, and, you know, and Pink Floyd and, you know, all the the standard uh, characters in the Pantheon. But um, but I did start on the banjo and, and, and learned a few bluegrass tunes and country and western tunes before, uh, before I taught myself how to play uh, the David Gilmore's solo in time kind of thing. So. <laughs> is that what you wanted to do when you first started playing electric guitar? Um, well, I don't, I don't know, because the, fir the first time I thought about wanting to make music, I think, if memory serves, I used to sing uh, the Stone song, Jumpin' Jack Flash, in front of the mirror all the time with, like, you know, using a hairbrush as a microphone or something. So sure. I think I was always interested in singing, but um, probably equally into playing the guitar. Yeah, I, I loved them both. I knew that at some point in my life, I just wanted to make music. Was Youth of Today your first "quote unquote" real band? No, no. In fact, in fact, I was in I was an underdog before I was in Youth of Today. But prior to that, um, the first, you know, I was always kind of jamming with friends and stuff. But the first band I was in that played shows out was a rockabilly band, uh, kind of a neo rockabilly slash psychabilly band called the Bel Airs. Uh, when I was in high school. And, you know, around 1981, uh, we started playing clubs. Um, we even we even got to play places like uh, the Mud Club and, and Max's Kansas City and a bunch in the Peppermint Lounge and a bunch of legendary now long closed yeah. clubs in New York. But we got to play with some really cool artists. You know, we got to everyone from we played with Carl Perkins, who was like a real like 50s rockabilly, you know, songwriting legend and, and performing legend. And we played with, you know, the Cramps and the Gun Club and, and a, a bunch of really cool, really cool bands. So at a, at a very young age, you know, from the time I was like 15, I was out in New York nightlife all the time. You know, I was I was going to all of the, the best clubs in New York at that age. Uh, 1981 was also the year I discovered hardcore. I saw the Bad Brains at, uh, at Max's Kansas City, um, which really, you know, ignited a spark in me. Um, They've had that effect on so many people. I hear like their name and just sort of that, like it just changed shit for so many people. I, I kind of miss them. They're kind of off my radar when I was, was coming up and, and getting my influences, but the amount of people in my life and times I've heard that, mm -hmm. what was it about that band? Uh, it's it's difficult to describe. You know, right right before I went to that show, first of all, you know, in hindsight, it's difficult to grasp things in context, right? So, I I had 
I listened to the pay to come seven inch before I went to see them. And I think the first pressings of that didn't even have a picture of them on it. So I didn't even know what they looked like or anything. And all I could think was, this is the fastest, loudest, most energetic mu music I've ever heard. And it's so singular. Like there's no one else sounds like this, you know? Like I was trying to, you know, it was like the drums kind of remind me a little bit of, I don't know, like Motorhead, but uh, who were also like kind of beloved by people who loved hardcore at that point too, in the very, very seminal early days of hardcore. But, and you know, like on Tim Summers on Noise, the show used to play Motorhead all the time, but there, there was no one that sounded like the Bad Brains, particularly HR singing and Earl's drumming. I mean, all, all of it, just all of it. Um, and I was really excited to go see them. And at the time I was playing in like a, you know, a cramps wannabe psychobilly band. And I remember just going to Max's and just seeing them play. And I think that before they went into anything loud and fast, they were playing just kind of like a little dub thing. And they were dressed like rude boys. They didn't have dreadlocks at that point, I don't think. But they just looked so fucking cool. They just looked, you know, they, they just had that badass kind of rude boy vibe. And then when they just really kicked it off and just seeing these bodies flying around, you know, on the dance floor. And, and I just never seen anything like it. I'd seen people like pogoing, you know, like... My older brother had taken me to like a couple of punk shows at CBGB's when he was going to NYU and stuff, but I had never seen anything like, you know, this loud, fast, hardcore music and, and bodies just kind of colliding. And, it, you know, it was, you know, I get goosebumps now every time I think about that moment. But, um, you know, it's, it's rare that you get to see a performance but that that is so visceral and isn't derivative or trying to emulate somebody else you know it's like it's really rare even within a, a genre that's like underground i mean you know they're not to disparage any bands in particular but you know you go to so many hardcore shows you hear a band play and you're like okay this you know they want to sound like integrity or whoever you know just think of any or they want to sound like hate breed you know there's it's like there's these this one group at the pinnacle, and, and I love those bands, by the way. I love those bands that, that carve that niche. I, you know, like I love Integrity, but I don't need 30 other bands that sound like Integrity, you know, when I can just listen to Integrity. I'm, I'm just pulling out any, any band, but, you know. Well, it's inevitable as it's, well when something of course. inspires. No, 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 that, and that's fine. And it, but you need to, kind of, you know, I, I think because life is short, you need to kind of just give it your own thing. You can, you can, mm -hmm. You could take all your influences and curate them however you want and, and mix them up however you want. But I think if you're if you're setting out to emulate another artist, that's just it's just weird to me. I just don't you know, I don't get it. So seeing the bad brains for me was um, you know, wasn't just eye opening, it was like kind of awe inspiring, especially at that point in context. Nothing sounded like that. And there wasn't, you know, there was nothing in the mainstream, of course, that that sounded like it. And even, you know, listening to something like Noise the Show, this this tiny little uh, radio station in New York, every time a Bad Brain song came on, it was, you know, it, it gave you chills. You know, so so yeah, that was a moment. And and then just uh, just that scene at that time in the early '80s was so. Um, it was just so real and so underground and raw and, you know, wasn't sponsored by anybody. It wasn't, there weren't like parents dropping their kids off at the show. It was, it was like raw and dangerous and visceral. And you had to go to like a shitty neighborhood to see shows. And it was just, you know, and you saw the same 50 faces all the time. It was, it was incredible, you know. It was definitely a time. I have so much of a, a romantic but, uh, feeling on those old shitty clubs. And sorry for my long, circuitous answer, but no, Youth of Today came later. Um, I was already in Underdog, um, which grew out of a band um, that I started circa 84 that was called the, shortly called the Numbskulls. And then, um, you know, we started and we played out uh, a few times. Um, and I used to always see Russ from... The scene. He was like one of the only people at New York hardcore shows with a skateboard. So we kind of gravitated to each other and we'd always talk. And And while he was in Murphy's Law and I was in uh, the Numbskulls, we just started talking about, you know, 
how how cool it would be if we were in a band together and i was like oh you know you should you should come play with us or whatever and you know it just kind of morphed one thing led to another some people from the numbskulls left russ left murphy's law mm. We started playing, and at first we were called True Blue for a couple of shows, and then we turned into Underdog, same band, just different name. Um, but uh, Youth of Today happened in the uh, in 1986. Um, Purcell from Youth of Today became my roommate. I had an apartment on Thompson Street in Manhattan, and and, uh, and he he moved into my apartment for a while. We were roommates for a long time. We became very very close friends. I became very close with with Ray Capo. I actually went to see their very first show. Um, they played with Agnostic Front uh, somewhere outside of the city, somewhere north of the city. And for me, it sounds so silly to say, because this was like in 1985, but for me, it made me nostalgic for like 1982. <laughs> because in 1985, bands started to not sound like the hardcore of 1982 anymore. You know, like, I, I think that's probably around when or maybe it was it was after that, but you know, like like SSD had put out "How We Rock," for instance, and like you know, like um, you know, bands were starting to sound more like stadium rock or metal, or, or you know, than than hardcore, which is fine. I I love so many genres of music, and I don't begrudge anybody for going in any creative direction. But it, it, but for me, it was nostalgic to go see Youth of Today when they opened for AF because it, you know, it reminded me of like the first time I saw a uh, negative approach or minor threat or DYS or any of those seminal hardcore bands that, you know, really resonated with me. And, uh, and I just instantly at that show just started talking with Ray and Purcell and we became fast friends and, and hung, hung out a lot. And uh, one thing led to another and, and uh, I think Purcell at one point, maybe it was Ray suggested, you know, why don't you, when he play guitar in Youth of Today, I was like, guys already have a guitar player. You got Purcell. And they were like, you know, we can all hang out together. Anyway, <laughs> I thought I could do that and sing for Underdog. But as it as it turned out, it ruffled lots of feathers. And I had to, for, you know, basically while I toured with uh, Youth of Today, someone else, uh, namely uh, Carl Mosher, rest his soul. He was a great, great guy and uh, a New York hardcore legend. Um, he sang for Underdog in my in my absence, and uh, oh, that's interesting. It was. It was. It was kind of. Is that weird for you, or were well, you happy that it could happen? I was happy it could happen. It was weird to just the thought of someone singing lyrics I had written was a little weird to me. It didn't make me feel bad, but I just thought, I wonder if these words feel the same to someone else who's singing them. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, writing lyrics is a very subjective very personal thing so um you know unless you're writing for someone else or like writing you know standards or jingles or something you're writing hardcore lyrics which are you know it's very usually a kind of a personal thing um so that was the only part that was weird for me but no i was glad that it could all happen and both bands could just continue doing it, doing their thing and i eventually actually you know, I recorded an album with you today, Break Down the Walls, uh, toured with them, which was amazing. We toured the country, played some shows uh, in Canada and uh, down in Mexico, I think, unless that was with Underdog. I'm already senile. But, um, you know, then returned to Underdog. Was that your first time on the road proper? First time touring, yeah. I mean, like, um, yeah, of course, you know, they were like Northeast shows that i played with the numbskulls and the bel airs before that you know so you know but we never went beyond like yeah massachusetts north or like virginia yeah stuff, you had like you know? the five hour cap <laughs> yeah well, five seven hour whatever yeah it was probably like you know richmond virginia to portland maine to like yeah maybe maybe cleveland at the outside you know going west but yeah you know. at what point did underdog for you did you feel like things were taking off in a way that that was like becoming serious option, like a full-time option or did it ever feel that way? Uh, well, I mean, it always just, it, it, it kind of always felt that way. It just, and, and I, and we never thought about taking off or anything like that. It was just, um, it's all I wanted to do every day. It was like make music. So whether we had a show or we were just kind of, you know, 
rehearsing or whatever it was, it it always felt full time to me. Um, but then we were we were approached by a, a friend from the West Coast named Billy Rubin, who had a little startup label called New Beginning. Uh, asked us if we wanted to do uh, an underdog seven inch, and I jumped at that opportunity. And uh, you know, we recorded this thing on a shoestring, and um, and it had some some life to it. You know, it was it was cool to to release something. You know, there had been like live like cassettes and stuff like bootlegs that people had made so some kids kind of learned some of the songs but it was cool to record these songs put them out in a seven inch and go play shows out of town and and people would like sing along with these words that you wrote and it's a it's a great feeling and it's not you know it's not an uncommon thing every every hardcore singer every singer of every band experiences this but it was um you know at that time being younger um it, it really touched me deeply to just see people in like this impassioned way like scream out these lyrics and you know um and throw their bodies off the stage so yeah was that the first time you had recorded your vocals uh for for a release yes but not the first time i i first time i recorded my vocals i was a very very young kid for like children's television shows my you know my I mean, this is really gonna fucking date me. But were you my, a child star? And we I was not know. a star by any, <laughs> any stretch. And the, you had but a market. I, I sang. My voice was recorded. My image was not captured <laughs> on camera, but my voice was recorded for some songs on children's television shows. But it, do you remember what it was? Yeah, I mean, my my mom wrote wrote lots of songs for the Captain Kangaroo show, and and then I also <laughs> I was also one of the kids who sang the theme song to something called. Uh, Slim Good Body. <laughs> ah, old Slim Good Body, huh? Yeah. There you go. He played the banjo too, I think. My, uh, you know, I used those residuals to buy my uh, 60,000 square foot house in Southampton. <laughs> um, <laughs> at, at what point, at what point does it, it seem like a good idea or was it a, a natural evolution beginning uh, into another? Uh, good Which is question. very much its own yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, um, so that happened. So it's in in 1989. Um, I was feeling very kind of stifled creatively. I felt I don't know. It was just like a weird, emotionally tumultuous time, and and I just felt uh, I felt kind of just constrained by like a scene and a genre and you know this kind of unspoken need to you know kind of conform to this supposedly non-conformist scene and well it teased that out a little bit because that's i think that's a really interesting theme that so many people you get this realization you've entered something that you wanted to enter and you entered it because of its originality you're feeling your own originality and then sometimes shit can feel like a little cultish be it be it oh, by thought or it, action it, or, or clothing yeah for me it was it was less look that that happens with any um you know like a i'm not gonna shit on hardcore or anything it happens with any subculture right it you know what after a while it's inevitable the like the impetus like the original thesis <laughs> is kind of moves aside and sort of the superficial style takes over and it's like you know people watch each other mosh and stage dive or something and whatever and and, and for me i just i felt personally stifled it's not like i felt like fuck this hardcore thing at all you know and i still loved hardcore and i still love the bands that i love then you know maybe even more now that i'm like this old nostalgic guy but um for me, I felt I felt stifled. I felt like I want to do something else creatively, um, and I had a kind of kindred spirit in that who was Drew, um, who played drums for Crippled Youth, which became Bold, and we were very very close friends. Uh, even though he's you know, years younger, he we were very close friends. In fact, he for a long time he dated my younger sister. But that's neither here nor there. But we were very close friends when I was. Before I even joined Youth of Today, and I was going to those early Youth of Today shows, um, 
he was always around and I went to like the early crippled youth shows and and uh and we had a lot of the same tastes in music you know we would talk in depth in like you know in minute nuanced detailed depth about David Bowie and about you know Queen and like all these bands that we loved and and uh, and T Rex and 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 the Stones and the Beatles and Floyd and and uh, in addition to all the hardcore music that we loved and in addition to all the you know British punk that we loved and and I don't know we just were um, really really um, related to each other um, like brothers and uh, and we're still that close and so in that year we were both we were constantly in touch. Um, he was a New Yorker too, and yeah, he grew up. He grew up uh, north of the city in the, in the burbs, and I, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. But um, we just um, we just always stayed in touch. And I, I remember in '89, that was kind of like we had both hit like the zenith of our disgruntled uh, feelings, um, and we were like, "Fuck it, let's just." You know, I was. I think I was finishing up an underdog tour, the last one. And uh, and it was like, when I get back to New York, you know, I called him from San Francisco. I was like, when I get back to New York, let's let's start making music. Mm. Just whatever comes out of us. And really, when we first started talking about what what became into another, we didn't have a name at that point. But the whole premise was there's no premise here. Like we're not we're not thinking about a scene. We're not thinking about genre or or anything or pleasing people making people happy at all we just wanted to express ourselves musically um and you know we almost carried that to the point where we then would joke about maybe even kind of purposefully alienating people <laughs> you know um you know because we, we would we would write these things and i'd be like oh my god can you imagine like like you know i'm seeing like rob halford high notes and you're playing like you know these like neil perter simon phillips like kind of drum fills and so it was just i don't know it was it was it was so much fun writing the early into another stuff the stuff that would become into another song yeah, and then of freedom, course total freedom total freedom yeah and 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 we didn't care we didn't set any goals for ourselves other than just creating all the time. So we, we tried as often as we could. We got together and just made music. You were playing guitar. I was initially playing guitar. And then we uh, and then wrote a couple of things. And then, you know, each person who subsequently joined, like I met Peter, Peter Moses, through his, his girlfriend at the time, um, a, a woman named Catherine Ludwig, who also sadly has left this, uh, this plane. Um, so, um, and she was great. She introduced me to Peter. Peter then introduced us to Tony, who had played in Whiplash. And, uh, and both of those guys came in with an incredible amount of songwriting ability. So, you know, from the beginning, once we were this four member ensemble, we were all writing together. It was just this beautiful thing. We would just go into a room and we'd, we'd all just start playing. I mean, and, Things just fell together. You know, someone had a riff or someone and someone had a, you know, hey, this can be a verse and this can be a chorus or, or one of us would come in with a, with a song written. And so the lyrics just flowed out of me because it was such it was just such like a fertile uh, environment for creativity when we all wrote music together. Were you um, writing um, lyrically? Were you writing differently at that point? And if yeah. so, was it a conscious effort to do so i mean maybe in a very general way but i think i just sort of got to that place where well first of all if you do anything for a while you get better at it and you you things become second nature and you don't have to force things but i do know that i with the into another stuff um i was i was determined to not be afraid to make myself totally vulnerable you know, to like sing about whatever, my insecurities or, or whatever I was feeling or, you know, whether it was rage or, you know, 
or sadness or, uh, you know, profound self-loathing, whatever it was. Um, so, you know, like w everything else that kind of went along with the, the ethos of that band, um, there were just no constraints. So a lot of what I wrote, you know, I'd read later and go, fuck, you know, should I like reveal this much? But, you know, it's, it's lyrics, it's poetry. So it's, it's, it's not expository writing. It's almost always employing metaphor or, or, you know, allegory. So, um, not that I hid behind those, those tools, but those, those tools make words more powerful and, and help each person who reads them or hears them or sings along with them have a unique experience, you know, not saying that I'm some great lyricist, but, but I think when you don't, uh, when you don't simply try and like rhyme words and you try and articulate what you're feeling, but doing, try and do it in a poetic way or, you know, or from a place that uh, where it's just pouring out of you in kind of a stream of consciousness way, or maybe, you know, you thought about, you know, three words that say as much as 30 words. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a really cathartic thing to do that without trying to fit into a scene or have a sing along or like, you know, <laughs> where's the breakdown going to be? Yeah. What, uh, were you a reader <clears throat> as a kid? Yes. Yeah, I was. I was a... What kind of stuff did you read? Well, I started out with Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web, and, uh, you know, that was right after the Dick and Jane books. But uh, I was into a lot of macabre literature. I was, you know, I was into Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and William Hope Hodgson. Um, I even wrote a song about him. He was a more obscure author who I discovered actually later after childhood. But as a kid, I was, I was obsessed with, with Poe. Um, and I read a lot of, uh, I don't know why I liked, I liked a lot of ghost stories, but I also liked a lot of like short sci-fi stories. Um, but as a kid, I, I read, you know, a lot of the books that were in the house and some of those were just like contemporary paperbacks, you know, like Stephen King books, but a lot of them were like 19th century and early 20th century kind of, you know, books that are in the canon of, of literature. And, and uh, so I, I, re I read a lot and I read a lot of poetry. I read a lot of Dylan Thomas and E.E. E. Cummings and, and Yeats and Browning and Keats and Oscar Wilde, and, um, like devoured poetry. It comes. The reason I'm asking is because it's it's clear, particularly through your lyrics with "Into Another," that it's it's very cinematic in a way. It, it's very literary. If, you know, a lot of it is like you're opening up a fantasy book. Um, yet the narrator, and this is just what I get from mm -hmm. it. The narrator, I I don't I often don't see as a man. I see as a boy, and I always thought that was interesting. That always struck me. I felt it was always very sweet in a way. I, that's the connection I had with a lot of your lyrics. It's very, yeah, wow, that's very insightful. And yeah. and it kind of made me pine for sort of like those days myself, even if the subject matter, the context that this narrator is in is scary or it's futuristic or there's fucking, you know, demons and goblins and monsters. And I just had a hunch that that might have come from, like, your boyhood readings. Yep. My oldest is really into fantasy and all these things. And when he's just sort of riffing and making up bullshit stories, they're always, like, they have, like, this angle on them. And it's the same sort of angle I've gotten from your lyrics and from mm -hmm. reading some of those books myself and just from art, modern art in general. And... uh I could also see how you must have, it must have been a pretty vulnerable kind of thing to put that out into, uh, you know, out into the hardcore world in particular, those listeners who were following you over. Mm -hmm. And then here's some lyrics that, you know, kind of challenge, I guess, the, I don't, I don't think hardcore lyrics have to have some kind of thing. I don't think it's a macho thing per se. I really don't. Although 
maybe it is and people feel that way but you were definitely taking a different angle which did not fit and i think that's very cool yet the music like it still hits like crazy and i'm sure you've seen some of the heaviest reactions from people at into another show yeah so <laughs> that was something that Long-winded per- question. I don't even know if there was a question. No, no, there. no. So, so well, first of all, you said something that was really astute, which is, um, you know, the kind of the protagonist in these stories was a boy, and that's actually very true. I wrote from that place because, for me, I, you know, I had a very tumultuous, uh, fucked-up childhood, and and I and I felt things very deeply then, and for a lot of reasons, a lot of it being self-preservation. By the time I was you know, a young man, I was already kind of jaded and world weary. So I, even though I felt a lot of things very deeply internally to, to really articulate them, I had to go back to that place. So that, that's a very astute observation, but, um, yeah, but Drew and I were, once we started playing shows, we were actually very humbled, very touched that some of these people, of course, a lot of them were like, fuck them, they suck, you know, and that's fine. Cause I've, I have never, ever cared what anybody fucking. Well, those picks. are fundamentalists. But whatever. And <laughs> God bless them. God love them. And uh, I got no time for those kind of. People. No, no. I mean, whatever. It's it's fine. Um, you know, purists. I mean, the, look, the the opposite of uh, of love is indifference, right? So that that's fine. But um, we Drew and I, I remember feeling we we both had this moment after the one of the first shows we played out where we saw these hardcore kids that kind of came to this weird place with us and just like let it rip and let it all hang out. And they were moved um, emotionally. And we were really touched by that. We were like, fuck, you know, like this feels amazing. Because that was, that was and is, I mean, of course it's much bigger than just this, but that's your scene still. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty amazing. You guys, you talked a lot earlier about, you know, having a sensitive compass to like things that aren't sounding fresh or aren't sounding new or a copy, whether it's a, they're trying to copy or just can't help it because their influences are just controlling them. It, nothing sounds like into another. So props to you and the band um, for creating something that doesn't sound like anything. And that's awesome, first of all. So props to you and the guys, but it's, it's, it's not something you can try and do like, I don't think anyone, everyone well, tries. Well, actually, point. it's 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 actually easy if you just cast off this self-imposed need to, like I said, it's it's great to be influenced by other people. I mean, you know, I, I, although I never consciously try and emulate anyone, I'm, I'm definitely influenced by everyone from, you know, Ian Gillen and David Bowie to HR and, you know, Jake Burns and Stiff Little Fingers and God knows who else. George Jones. I mean, like, um, Nat, you know, Nat King Cole. I, I mean, like, that's fine. But um, it's when you consciously pursue emulating someone else that I think you you stifle your growth. Yeah, well, you guys, you guys nailed it. Nothing sounds like your band um i was a fan i am a fan uh so i i I just like listening to your guys music in fact uh the first time i got out of the country and toured we were over in europe and where we were staying there was a massive record collection you know true german geek you could picture it the whole walls everything's curated and usually what we wanted at night the only thing plus everyone has to agree which is nearly impossible which is why touring so amazing um ignore us like put like that was like our jam every night so that album in particular has a really special place in my heart because i instantly put myself i'm on tour (laughs) you know i I, i'm doing it isn't that cool (laughs) i mean how music can connect you to certain periods in your life it's it's amazing it's It's the best thing in the world and it's it spans time, you know? What, what mm-hmm. do we say? 1827, Ein Klein Nacht Music was published, uh, released, and published, and it it spans, it's, it's fucking amazing. Yeah, well, it transcends time. For, for me, it's like, I can hear a certain song. I can hear like a Sly and the Family Stone song, 
and I'm in the back seat of like my mom's car while she smokes cigarettes with the windows rolled up. You know, like I can, it's such a powerful sense memory music and it can take you right back to a place in time, you know, really vividly. And uh, it's it's magic. It's just it's just you know sound vibrations in in, in the air. It's you know, primal. It's, like it's primal. It's things hitting you yeah. literally and figuratively. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was bringing up some of your music the other day, um, and I realized because I still have one foot in the old school, so like I have a physical copy of just about everything that I purchased before eight ten years ago, I guess. So Seamless is a really badass album, I think, by Into Another. Um, it's not on Spotify. Like, why is that? Because we had a very uh, acrimonious divorce from our record label, and they deleted us from their catalog. Um, Can you put that up? Yeah, so we're at the point now where the rights have reverted back to us. I think we had a 20-year Jesus. term or something. So I just have to, uh, I just have to do that. Oh, so... I have to go and acquire it and and do that. And it's silly that I haven't. But um, yeah, so Seamless, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's little known because of that, because Hollywood Records deleted it um, out of spite from their catalog. Well, fuck you, Hollywood Records. Bad choice, because that's <laughs> a killer album. So I hope Thanks. that you, I hope that you put it on your, Oh shit! I need to do this. List. Yeah, it is. It's been on that. We list all for have a the while. list. Yeah. It's at, but that's a really good record. And then I have um, a really good friend of mine. Uh, shout out to Chris Denley. How are you, Chris? He wanted to know like what's the deal with the Soul Control album. And he asked me. I said I have absolutely no idea. So, yeah. So that's an unfinished album. Um, that that album. We were making that album while we fell into this horrible bitter uh battle with our record label um for myriad reasons they they had totally fucked up so many things um you know to give an example like we we were on tour with the ramones and white zombie and our cd which was supposed to have been which or you know our album in whatever formats was supposed to have been distributed and available to people that would be good. W- wasn't. In the cities you were playing. Anywhere. Uh, and then we went to Europe and the, 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 although the album art and the jewel box and the insert were all into another seamless, the, and even the art that was screened onto the disc itself, the music was some like trans band for, you know, like it, it, the, so the distributor. Dude manufactured and distributed our <laughs> album in Europe with the wrong music. It wasn't even us. There were a million things that happened. Anyway, so while we were making the album that had a couple of working titles that I, one of them was uh, Horse Platitudes, which was spelled like H-O-A-R-S-E, like horse voice like I have right now, and <laughs> Platitudes, which was a take on the Doors, Horse Latitudes. Another working title was Soul Control. So it never really even got to the point where I like said this is the title of this record, but um, you know, so that album basically needed some some guitar tracks and more guitar tracks, and it needed to be properly mixed, and and and, and that stuff never happened. Uh, but it did leak, and which is is great. I mean, you know, we that never uh, benefited any member of Into Another financially, of course, that it leaked. But at least people got to hear those songs in a weird kind of unfinished state do you care that it's not done yeah of course i mean it's 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 kind of sad and tragic to me that we never got to finish it but um yeah it's when everything blew up with our record label and, and um was that the demise of the band as well yeah sort of the, yeah it, it, the issues it, with the label just it res- spread to it, everything it resulted in the demise of the band um you know i think we were all it just kind of irreparably damaged us collectively kind of emotionally and we died kind of like a slow death we didn't just say like you know we you know we proclaim that on this date into another is over it didn't happen that way it just sort of fizzled out well not all the way because i saw you guys at the revelation records 
25th. Tw- is that what it was? I don't want to mess it up. I'll let you do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anniversary t- 2012, show. 15 years ago. Gee, no, uh, no. Sorry, ten years. Nine years. 10 years. Coming up on 10. Coming up on 10. None of us will be I doing did anyone's accounting <laughs> later today. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> I went to that show. Um, you guys were the headliners, if I remember. I, I forget who I went with, so probably one of my boys. Yell at me later. And I, I made sure I got there early because... Iceburn was one of my favorite weirdo yeah we love them bands yeah. from again a band that there's nothing hardcore about them really I mean some of the stuff but they were just in that scene probably based on their record label affiliation and I loved Iceburn yeah we loved them and they actually became friends of ours back then they were they were really cool and just the fact that they were from Salt Lake City you know just so many things about them were just they were mysterious unusual and mysterious and cool saw them at City Gardens. Um, and it was amazing. And they just released something not that long ago, um, um, yeah. which was awesome. Yes, it was great. It um, was fucking heavy as No, hell. we love those guys. By the way, qu- quick sort of non sequitur. 15 years was in my head because 15 years ago, CBGB's closed. And on my way here, I realized that, um, that 15 years and uh, five days ago, Underdog played one of the last shows at CB's. So that's why that... 15 years was in my head. You guys just about closed it out. We were, yeah, one of the last shows. We were, a f- it was a few, it was five days before the last day or four days before the last day. Um, but it was uh, Underdog. We, we, we played with uh, the Bad Brains and the Stimulators in 2006, that week that it closed. That show <clears throat> uh, in New York, the Revelation 25th anniversary. Obviously, I got there early because I want to see Iceburn. Props to Iceburn. People, you should listen to Iceburn. If you like some, I don't know what the fuck their music is. Absolutely. But just yeah. go get it. Eat some of it up. Um, and you guys were the headliner. And I didn't know what to expect. Uh, not because I had a preconceived notion. I was just like, man, you know, it's like, it's been a while. Like mm-hmm. I'm certainly a bit older, and I like worked my way up towards the front because I wanted to get a, I wanted to get a few picks, and I wanted to actually hear the stage sound. I didn't want to hear the uh, house. Yeah. And um, you guys came out like a fucking mountain. It was just like, oh, and the, <laughs> the fucking place went ballistic, and I was like, holy shit, I'm in the worst. What am I thinking? <laughs> like all of my hardcore skills from all the years, they all were like, oh, let me just stand here. And um, anyway, I still have a lot of good skills and I was able to keep my spot and you guys lit it up. It was awesome. And in particular, I didn't know at the time that your bassist had passed and you had his picture up on a bass amp and I thought that was classy. And that's that's certainly not your move. That's been done many times. I always just appreciated that move, you know, because that's where you really experience people, um, artists, you're just looking at them on a stage and to have the picture looking back was touching. And I'm sorry for your loss there and his yeah, family I mean, as well. He's Tony is always with us. He was such a, such a force of nature. Tony It was just pure music. He was just made of music. Just, you know, he was born just to make music. Um, yeah. And it, it still, it stings all the time uh, to think about that loss. I will say the 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 guys we gained for that second incarnation of Into Another, um, were it not for Reed and Brian, Reed who played plays bass for us now, and and Brian who plays guitar along with Peter. Oh right, um, there was a second guitarist. That's right. Yeah, we would we would never have gotten uh, back together were it not for those two guys. They they made it happen. So they reached out to us and they they made it happen. Um, and it wasn't easy. And, you know, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to them, you know, Drew and Peter and I. Well, that made it probably extra real mm-hmm. uh, and and not like whatever else it could be sort of perceived as. I, not just real, like we really, once we all played together, it felt, it felt like Into Another had never stopped and it felt like those guys were just there from the beginning. They just felt like family. They um, nailed it. And they still do. Yeah. And they totally nailed it. I was like, oh, okay, that's great. And they're amazing people. Each of them is an amazing person. Um, so, yeah, so incredibly fortunate to have crossed paths with them. And, you know, you can't, I can't overstate Tony's uh, bass playing. Um, 
I mentioned that album, Ignore Us. Am I saying it right? Yeah. All right. It's a play on the words, ignore us. You know. I like it. I like it. I just want to make sure. I was like, am I saying it right? Anyway, that album, folks, Ignore Us, which you should listen to, the first thing that grabs you and grabs you excellently is the bass. It opens up with a sweet bass line into just a freaking killer song and how that album comes in. It's like, well, come, like a mountain, you know, maybe a little softer mountain than you came in at the show, but you guys, it's, it's always big. It's always fucking gigantic. The stories are big, <laughs> even if the narrator is small and the sound is always gigantic. And I love that. So yeah. are you guys, what happened after that show? Did, did that ignite something? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we just kept playing shows anytime we could. We're all spread out in different parts of the country. Um, <sighs> So it's difficult logistically, but um, since since those shows, there was one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast in 2012, um, we've played continuously, albeit, you know, few and far between, but um, we haven't stopped. And in fact, we're, we're still writing songs, you know, who knows what will become of those songs. Um, we released a five song EP in 2015. Um, you know, so we might do something like that again soon because we're we haven't stopped writing. And so we, a new album or EP is on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, even though we're we're all many miles apart from one another, we continue to write. Yeah, where is everybody exactly? Uh, so Reed, um, our bass player, uh, lives in San Francisco. Uh, Brian guitar player, uh, one of the two guitar players, lives in Southern California. Mm. Peter Moses, original guitarist, um, lives way upstate New York. Um, I live in New York City, uh, as does Drew in another borough. But um, yeah, so we're, we're spread out and, um, you know, finding time. We all have, you know, we've all got day jobs and and uh and and families and stuff so it's it's tough to find those windows of time but you know yeah, we, sure. and of course covid you know put the brakes on a lot of it we actually had a uh, a little tour plan before the pandemic started oh which we had to uh and we actually had to cancel uh, a bunch of shows because peter fell uh ill um although he battled back but um yeah so it's been a while it's been it's been far too long since we've played. I love his guitar playing. Peter Moses, oh, yeah, fucking he's... nasty. I don't know how to. Again, it's hard to describe uh, the band. It's even and it's hard to describe <clears throat> the individual elements of the band. His guitar playing is awesome. Yeah, um, I can never do what he does. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm so glad you're not I, the guitarist in that band. <laughs> I've, I, I've been playing guitar my whole life. I couldn't even dream of doing what he does. Yeah. What do you do? Um, what other creative outlets uh, do you have? Just like, you know, fucking in your mind, in your heart, that doesn't involve obviously having to promote anything. Aside from the fact that I consider myself one of the, the world's greatest doodlers. Um, uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, uh, what do you like to doodle? You know, I, uh, you know, the same shit as when I was a kid. Just I like, know. Never. <laughs> I got my thing too. Of course. You know, like fucking zombies and shit but um i uh you know I, I there's always a guitar in the house and i'm always making sounds of some sort and um you know my day job lets me be creative um visually um and, and all jokes aside i do like to draw and and uh you know i, I i'm i i find ways to uh, express myself creatively even if no one sees it except for maybe my kids you know but um, or hears it, whatever I'm doing. Sure. But um, but I ne I never stop. You know, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't imagine, you know, life without at least one musical instrument in the house and and you know some. Oh yeah, kill me, man. Like, some paper I, and some ink and stuff. Yeah. That's that's the good sauce. What are you you reading anything right now? Anything interesting? I'll share with the audience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Literary recommendation. Well, so I've you know because of the horrible state of the world um you know i've i've uh i've kind of stopped reading 
nonfiction because at best it just gets my hope up that like the Republic isn't dead and stinking and there's not another, you know, there's not an impending uh, mass extinction, things like, you know, like reality. So I've been escaping back into um, books I loved as a kid, like a lot of old, oh. old, you know, Emily Bronte and, uh, and you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, um, uh, you know, like I reread uh, Middlemarch lately. I've actually been reading, I have a, a book of, uh, of Rudyard Kipling uh, poems and short stories and... Um, and there's no middle school teacher telling you to read this? No, no. It, it's like weird. You don't have a it's, quiz next week? It's like weird comfort food for me. And and also, my kids are, my daughter's a bookworm, and she's getting really into, um, she's really into reading. She reads all these, uh, she's 12 now. She reads all these series, you know, like, um, and has been doing so for years since she was very young. But That's I'm actually what my getting guy her likes, the series, long series. Yeah, she loves those. Um, and I hate them because you always have to keep buying the next ones. But uh, That's correct. Um, <laughs> and these authors are way too prolific. They must have like five ghostwriters each. Um, but she's, she's actually, she's recently discovered Edgar Allan Poe. So I'm rereading some of that stuff like with her and just to be able to talk to her about it, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've been, um, sadly, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but in most of the media I consume, um, is a lot of it's out of nostalgia. So I, I you know, like, I rewatch a lot of old films. I, I, I do keep up with like contemporary pop culture, and like, you know, you could ask me questions about Squid Game. It's cool, but, <laughs> but I. Uh, well, fuck it. You don't have to because no. you're you create things so but, you, well, you, no. you have a huge pass you don't but, need but, to be in touch but, but I, I i consume you know i i consume pop culture too i do see films and and read books and uh and and listen to music but but i probably much more often than i should i go back in time and sort of soothe myself with old shit that's uh yeah that's that's what we all do. We should be doing with our inner children. Go back, massage it, make it make it better, because um, those things stick with us our whole lives. That's for true. Uh, that's the truth. Well, I, I I'm gonna let you get back to your Kipling. I really appreciate I appreciate you um, just being responsive and and responding to some random dude who who. Uh, what is it slid into your dm oh man uh, is that the i don't even know if that's the I'm, you know, never saying it again never saying it again i'm sure you know anyone listening is is saying okay boomer at this point although technically <laughs> I'm, I'm i just missed the baby boomer generation so <laughs> well i appreciate you man and and i love the art you make and of course it's not yours alone it's a collaboration so i appreciate that as well and thanks michael i look forward to uh the next thing you're doing whatever it is and um Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, loved being here and look forward to the next one. Right on, man. All, All right. right. See you all. Have a good day. Bye.